Oliver Cromwell. Oliver Cromwell's extraordinary achievement was to make a civil war popular amongst the English. Now, the Americans and the Spanish, you could understand it, they have a bit of passion. Or the Italians, you can see that. Passion, fire, you could say anything to an Italian, I think you should be able to use a knife with spaghetti. <laughs> but the English, you could go up to an Englishman and say, I'd like to take away your wife in exchange for a mule. Oh, you better go, dear, we don't want to make a fuss. <laughs> War in England must have just been thousands of people on fields with pikes facing each other going, well, they said it'd be sunny in the fall, car. <laughs> Oliver Cromwell was an astonishing character. He was one of the great military commanders of all time. And yet when he began his military career, it was a 42-year-old farmer from East Anglia. Now, our image of him is of him yelling things like, uh, March 4th, for God and for England. But, in reality, his orders must have been things like, Calm you down. <laughs> you don't want to go down Bury St Edmunds. <laughs> Rat race down there. <laughs> Cromwell was born in 1599, at a time when most people's lives were dominated by two institutions, the church and the monarchy. The church was the local government. It distributed relief for the poor. It organised the only entertainment. It educated children. The weekly sermon was the only source of information providing the news, especially local news. So a service probably ended. And here are the main points of the sermon again. <laughs> the king has apologised for recent remarks in which he said that a candlestick at one of his residences must have been installed by an Indian. <laughs> And if you're taking the kids to the South World Witch Burning this weekend, don't forget there are roadworks on the Ipswich Turnpike. <laughs> the other dominant institution was the monarchy. The king called Parliament whenever he liked, usually to raise a new tax, and he dismissed it whenever he liked. All English men and women were members of the Church of England, whether they liked it or not. It was an offence not to attend on a Sunday. It was even an offence to attend a church outside your own parish, which was probably to stop the middle classes going, well, we know that Nathan and Jemima ought to go to the local church, but the one at Kensington's got such marvellous facilities. <laughs> But in some ways, the most decisive aspect of royal power was in terms of ideas. The king was seen by most people as God's envoy on earth. A story, for example, was circulated that the king's spit had cured a sick child. <laughs> now, since then, we've had 350 years of medical advances, and I bet if someone started up a similar story now, you'd have half of Islington going, we don't touch antibiotics anymore. <laughs> we go to the Gobbo Therapy Centre on Upper Street. <laughs> Anyone who questioned the status quo was in trouble. In 1634, a lawyer called William Prynne printed an attack on the Queen and was sentenced to be... Fined, pilloried and have his ears cropped. <laughs> Three years later, he was caught again for publishing another seditious paper called News from Ipswich. <laughs> How can anything be a threat to the state when it's called News from Ipswich? <laughs> From the early 1600s onwards, these radical ideas found expression in the ideals and beliefs of the Puritans, whose most famous disciple came to be Oliver Cromwell. So, what did Puritans believe? Well, according to one current school book, The English Civil War... As a strict Puritan, Cromwell believed in hard work. He had no time for sinful pleasures, such as gambling, going to the theatre, or eating Christmas dinner. <laughs> How can anyone honestly believe that a mass following can be built for a religion on not doing three random things, one of which is eating Christmas dinner. <laughs> <laughs> and besides, if Puritans were just obsessed with being miserable, how did they take off as a religious movement? Well, in the Catholic and the old Protestant church, people worshipped God via the priest. The common man or woman couldn't get through to God except through this intermediary. So the priest was like an important person's secretary. And if anyone tried to get in touch with God directly, they got the priest going... I'm afraid he's in a meeting at the moment. <laughs> But the Puritans came from a different background, mostly small landowners and craftsmen, what were called the middling sort. 
So they believed in each person having their own individual relationship with God. So Cromwell talked about wrestling with God, trying to work out each day what God wanted you to decide on earth. At the age of 18, Cromwell became a student at Cambridge, where, according to James Heath, he would accost women in the streets in order to... Perforce ravish a kiss or some nuder satisfaction upon them. <laughs> so he was just like any male student. <laughs> After his studies, Cromwell lived in London until, with his new wife, he returned home to help run the family estate. But he had hardly any income and he was dependent on the odd bits of inheritance that were coming through to him as his old relatives died. Cromwell then became depressed and he visited a physician called Sir Theodore Mayern, who described him as extremely melancholy. But there was no counselling in them days, because what use would it have been? So, after your land was enclosed and you were forced into the town as vagabonds and your family all got the plague, did you feel resentful in any way? <laughs> It's assumed that during this period, Cromwell had a sudden conversion, becoming a fully-fledged Puritan activist. But more likely, I think, is that his move towards religious activism at this time was the result of the political events happening in the country. In 1628, he used his influence to become an MP for Huntingdon. The political situation heightened his depression. The Petition of Right had been introduced by Parliament to make unparliamentary taxation illegal. But... Then the king just declared it null and void, along with his closest advisor, who was called Archbishop Lord. Then when Charles I, in 1629, wound the Parliament up altogether, Cromwell said that the Petition of Right should actually have been called the Petition of Shite. <laughs> How childish can you get? <laughs> this is one of the greatest characters in English history with a mental age of about six. <laughs> Sat at the back of Parliament going, Petitioner Right, more like, this is a sign. <laughs> Archbishop Lord was singled out as a hate figure as it was feared that he was going to bring back Catholicism. And so then on May the 9th, 1640, a leaflet was posted on the old exchange calling on apprentices to invade Lambeth Palace. In Lord's diary for May the 11th, he wrote, at midnight, my house at Lambeth was beset with 500 of these rascal routers. I strengthened the house as well as I could. They continued there for two full hours. Lord fled from the palace by river, which must have created one of the most amazing sights in all history. An archbishop desperately rowing across the Thames in all his gear, <laughs> probably using the crook as an oar. <laughs> While anyone walking along the embankment must have gone, oh, look, they're filming a Monty Python skit. <laughs> there was more resistance to the king when he introduced the ship tax to pay for the navy. Now, previously, this had only been payable in the coastal areas, but it was now extended across the whole country. So a campaign was led by a squire from Buckingham called John Hamden, who refused to pay. So a mass non-payment campaign developed. So there were probably marches of thousands of people going, no ship tax! No ship tax, can't payeth, won't payeth. No ship tax. <laughs> and I expect the king tried to defuse the situation by giving it another name. <laughs> it is not the ship tax, it is the maritime charge. <laughs> <laughs> Cromwell must have watched these movements with fascination. In 1640, he became MP for St Ives when Charles recalled the Parliament to deal with his financial crisis. Opposition to the King in Parliament was led by a man called John Pym. So the King decided to arrest John Pym and four of his colleagues in the House of Commons, but the word got out and the five MPs escaped just in time and thousands of Londoners marched through London the next day in defence of the five MPs. And this was the first ever, really, demonstration. It wasn't just sort of like now where people just wander along like it's a job. Oh, hello, you're a bit late. What one is it today? Is it Ireland? Oh, I can't remember. <laughs> The King rode to Nottingham and with his family on August the 22nd, 1642, he held a ceremony in the rain in which the King declared war. His herald read out the King's proclamation, but Charles had amended the original. And so the herald had to keep stopping because he couldn't read Charles's writing. <laughs> then the royal flag was raised as a symbol of the war, but a gale blew it over and there was a big argument where nobody wanted to put it back up again because they didn't want to get out in the rain. <laughs> And I bet there were still people going, yeah, but they do a marvellous job and they bring in a lot of tourists. <laughs> this 
was Cromwell's calling. Years of feeling frustrated and not knowing how to act on his religious and political ideas finally came to a point. So he raised two companies of volunteers in Cambridge and with his brothers-in-law he surrounded the university to stop them sending £20,000 worth of goods to the king. Soon after that he went to Hartford and he seized the sheriff in the market at St Albans. Now the thing to remember here, Cromwell wasn't an employee of the army, he was a farmer, a Puritan and an MP. When he raised a regiment to go to Cambridge and St Albans, he wasn't acting on orders, he just decided to do it. The war hadn't even started at this point, but in fact this was the heart of Cromwell's historical achievement. Because raising your own army is a course of action that you can only really do if you are extremely confident and extremely motivated, isn't it? I mean, I can't stand Noel Edmonds. <laughs> never seriously considered gathering together all my family and friends <laughs> and forming an army and arresting him in St Albans Market. <laughs> well, I have actually, but... <laughs> but the thing is, Cromwell actually did it. So who made up the armies in this civil war? Well, there were two very different sorts of armies. Sir Philip Warwick quoted a royalist soldier. In our army, we have the sins of men, drinking and wenching. But in yours, you have the sins of devils, spiritual pride and rebellion. Which shows you how highly motivated the parliamentary army must have been, doesn't it? Because what sort of organisation advertises itself by saying, Join our side, not theirs! We've got spiritual pride! All they've got is drinking and whinging! <laughs> One of the commanders of the Royalist forces was Prince Rupert, whose poodle, called Boy, <laughs> apparently cocked his leg whenever he heard the word Pim. And he accompanied his owner on every battle until he was shot at the Battle of Marston Moor. The King's generals were all drawn from the aristocracy, whereas Cromwell formed an army led by commoners. He said, I would rather have a plain russet-coated captain that knows what he fights for and loves what he knows than that which you call a gentleman and is nothing else. So Cromwell's men were bound to be more committed fighters than men led by a bloke called Rupert who wandered around the battlefield with a poodle going, Look, I say Pim and he does a wee wee! <laughs> Both sides began the war manoeuvring for position, the King's army edging towards London while the commander of the Parliamentary Army, the Earl of Essex, moved his army towards him. Essex took with him to battle, it is said, a winding sheet, a coffin, and as he put it, everything needed for my funeral. <laughs> That's how to inspire your troops, isn't it? <laughs> Imagine Monty in the desert behaving like that. Yes, three cheers for Monty, another morale-boosting visit to our troops in the front line. And what's that? Yes, it's his coffin, just in case. <laughs> The first major battle of the Civil War was at Edge Hill near Banbury, where Cromwell took his regiment there under Essex's command. Now, neither side won a clear victory, but the important part of the outcome was that Cromwell realised the parliamentary army was weak and could only win if the tactics that he'd used to build his own regiment were employed throughout the rest of the army. In January 1644 came the Battle of Marston Moor near York, ending in complete victory for Parliament, and Cromwell's cavalry had been decisive. So Cromwell persuaded Parliament to pass a law called the Self-Denying Ordinance, which barred nobles and MPs from holding office in the army. Now this was to take the army out of the hands of the compromisers and pass it to Cromwell. But there was, however, of course, one flaw in this logic, which was that Cromwell was an MP as well. So they then had to pass a second law, exempting Cromwell from the first law. <laughs> but as a result, the army was transformed and it was renamed the New Model Army. And this army could be drawn from all ranks of society. Soldiers would elect officers who would meet in soldiers' councils and hold regular meetings in each regiment discussing political and religious ideas. And the army's biggest test came the following year. The Battle of Naseby took place involving 25,000 men charging repeatedly at each other until Charles sent in his reserve force, which mistook their instructions, marched left instead of right, and hundreds of royal troops were killed and 5,000 captured. After Naseby, the King returned to Oxford, where he learnt that his armies had been routed in Cornwall, Devon, Dorset and Hampshire, and was forced to accept a surrender. Cromwell and the Puritans were convinced that their victory had been won by God. Now, in one way, there's nothing particularly unusual about this given that every general in every war in history has always been convinced that God is on their side. <laughs> there is no case, as far as I know, of the leader of a country that's at war going, last night I prayed to God in this hour, hour of need, and he answered me, 
in his prayers. Uh, and unfortunately, he's backing the Turks on this one. <laughs> The king had been captured by the army and taken to Hampton Court, so Cromwell was against executing him at this point, saying that this would be a horrid act. But one night, Charles slipped through a vault and up some back stairs to escape along the river and flee to the Isle of Wight. Cromwell was unsure, though, as to whether he could fight a second war, and he was considering and doing a deal with the king. But then he and his second-in-command, Fairfax, got a tip-off from a spy who worked for the king. The spy told them to go to the Blue Boar Inn at Holborn in London at 10 o'clock that night and wait for a man to come in the pub with a saddle on his head. <laughs> the man would leave the saddle, whereupon Cromwell would rip open the saddle and inside would be a secret decree written by the King in which he'd written of his intention to bring Parliament and Cromwell to their final doom. So how can anyone say that Cromwell was no fun? <laughs> Can you imagine this with a modern world leader wandering into a pub and finding Jack Chirac or Colonel Gaddafi sat there going, oh, hello, I'm just waiting for a man with a saddle on his head. <laughs> Yeltsin, perhaps. <laughs> so compromise was clearly not possible, especially after royalist revolts started flaring up and Cromwell argued at this point in the House of Commons that the war had to be restarted. But apparently, after this debate, he threw a cushion at one of the other MPs, a man called Ludlow, and the two of them ran downstairs having a cushion fight. <laughs> like I said, this is a military genius with a mental age of about seven. <laughs> they probably made victory speeches like, let us enjoy the fruits of victory. Fairfax, you're it. <laughs> This time the Royalists were defeated much more quickly, but there was another difference between the two wars. The army divided again, but this time Cromwell was on the Conservative side against a group called the Levellers. The Levellers had written a pamphlet called The Agreement of the People, which their supporters in the army wore in their hats while they were marching. The pamphlet argued for a Britain in which every household had the vote, with elections every two years, with every citizen holding equal rights, there'd be a written constitution, the monarchy and the House of Lords would be scrapped. Following the agreement of the people, therefore, a series of debates were organised in Putney, London, to be held between Cromwell and the Levellers about how the New England should be governed. Now, this wasn't just some dodgy focus group. The leader of the army and the most powerful people in the country were sitting around with the most radical group in society to discuss how Britain should be governed. This is unimaginable now, not just because we'd never have anything so democratic, but because even if we did, it'd be staged by Carlton TV and hosted by Vanessa Feltz. <laughs> you speak of universal rights, and yet are they which are the most yielding, not in possession of the greatest wisdom? I would fain know how such men come to be of such property in the first, sire. Well, I don't know who's right or who's wrong, but I think you're both lovely. <laughs> when a master weaver hired an apprentice boy who turned out to be a transvestite. We'll find out after the break. <laughs> in a few months, around the beginning of 1649, Cromwell reached the decisive point in all of his major political relationships with the compromisers on his own side, with royalty, with the levellers and with the Irish. At the end of the previous year, Cromwell had offered Charles a final chance of compromise, but Charles refused. So Cromwell ordered the army to arrest him, which they did. The House of Commons records for the 23rd of December state... The House had much debate this day about bringing the great delinquents of this kingdom to speedy punishment. In other words, they wanted a fast track for persistent offenders. <laughs> During the King's trial, there was such concern that a rescue attempt would be made that the Lord President of the court, John Bradshaw, wore a hat made of steel as protection. And the trial was in Westminster Hall. The charge against the King was read out, at which point the knob fell off of the King's cane, causing what must have been one of the great dramatic moments of history. The King stood there, waiting for someone to pick it up, and eventually, after several minutes, realised that he would have to do it himself. The charge was that he'd led forces against Parliament at York, Edgehill, Kinneton Field, Brentford, Reading, Gloucester, Leicester, Cropperty Bridge, Cornwall, Newbury, Naseby, Kent, Essex, Surrey, Sussex and Middlesex. 
must have been tempting after reading that lot out to go, and all leading high street stores. <laughs> And I bet a lot of old Tories were going, Look, I don't approve of all these atrocities, but it was a long time ago. He's an old man now. Why don't we just let him live in peace in Chile? <laughs> the King refused even to register a plea or to answer any questions, saying he didn't recognise the court. So he was found guilty of high treason, murders, rapines, burnings, spoils, desolations, damage and mischief. <laughs> Well, the others, yes, but mischief, that's just sick. <laughs> Cromwell, Fairfax and his colleagues signed the King's death warrant. And this was the moment at which Cromwell coalesced at one and the same time into the two different parts of his personality. The inspired and inspiring ruthless commander and the cushion fighter. <laughs> For as he signed the death warrant, he splashed ink over Henry Martin's face who then splashed ink back over him. <laughs> and the whole room descended into an immense ink fight. <laughs> well, surely the whole fun of an ink fight is that you know you're doing something a bit naughty. They were chopping off the king's head, isn't that naughty enough? <laughs> what do you think, there was someone going, oh, stop that, look, I mean, if we get done for this killing the king thing, we'll be in enough trouble as it is. <laughs> On the 30th of January 1649, the King was executed and power passed at that stage in reality to the army. Cromwell then turned his attention to two very different armies. He crushed the leveller movement and executed the leaders. And then he was ready to send an expedition to Ireland, where he organised his famous siege and assault on the garrison at Drogheda, in which he gave the order that no quarter was to be given. Almost 2,000 people were killed, many of them English royalist troops, but also Catholic priests and most of those that had been at first taken prisoner. I'd say that in both of these cases, really, the levellers and Drogheda, he displayed everything he stood for, the radicalism and the brutality at the same point, because Cromwell did believe in a new society, with God rewarding those who earned merit. But his ideal of this society was one that was still divided, but instead of by birthright, by property. The Royalists did try one further attack. They crowned Charles' son, King Charles II, and they staged another rising in Scotland, but were heavily defeated. This time the war was definitely over, and the army had in effect been running the country, but now power went to Parliament. But in 1653, Cromwell marched into the Commons wearing his hat and accused the MPs of injustice, petty jealousies, private sins, drunkenness, embezzlement and uncleanliness. <coughs> and I bet he thought, in 350 years' time, no one would believe it possible that politicians behave like this. <laughs> Cromwell wound the Parliament up and he nominated the MPs for a new one, which was called the Barebones Parliament, after one of its members called Praise God Barebone. <laughs> it was said at that time that apparently Praise God had two brothers, one who was called Christ came into the world to save Barebone, <laughs> and the other, if Christ had not died, thou hadst been damned, Barebone. <laughs> So it's assumed that Barebone's father was obviously deeply religious, but uh, maybe not, maybe he was just a rock star. <laughs> but we just can't call him Henry. I mean, what about La La Leviticus, Day of Judgment, Holy Ghost, Deuteronomy, Trixie Bell? <laughs> a new tax was established on the estates of the gentry, known as the Extraction of the Tyrants. Cromwell never really mastered the transition from commander to politician. For example, when he was questioned about the economy, he answered, Here is somewhat that is exceedingly past my understanding, for I have as little skill in arithmetic as I have in the law. These are great sums. <laughs> well, that'd be brilliant if the Chancellor said that now. So... <laughs> Some MPs dribbling on, is it not an indictment of the current fiscal policy? Nah, 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 nah. And the Chancellor went, blimey, that's an odd sum. <laughs> <laughs> the Parliament collapsed after a year, having got little support from wealthy businessmen for the radicalism, and none at all from the gentry, all of which left Cromwell depressed. For him, the bare-bones Parliament was his shot at creating a nation along Puritan lines. Eventually, the rest of Parliament offered Cromwell the post of king, which he turned down. Wouldn't it be brilliant to go down the job centre to sign on the dole in those circumstances? <laughs> Have you had any offers of work which you've rejected at all? Yes, there was one. Mm. <laughs> really, 
what, what was the job? King. <laughs> he did attempt to reform the House of Lords, planning to scrap hereditary peerages and replace them with appointed lords. He moved into Hampton Court, where far from insisting on frugal misery, his main hobby was music. He employed a full-time organist, and he had his favourite organ moved from London to Hampton Court for that purpose. The first ever operas in London took place during Cromwell's reign. And the first ever pineapple, apparently, in Britain was presented to Cromwell. Uh, some historians argue that he was motivated simply by personal ambition. But if he was just after wealth and glory, why was it that he was most depressed when he was surrounded by it? The very existence of these trappings must have reminded, it seems to me, must have reminded him on a daily basis that his project for a society based on Puritan ideals had failed. He died in 1658, utterly depressed, and his son Richard took over as protector, but after two years, Parliament called for Charles II and restored the Stuart dynasty to the throne. Although the restored monarchy had only a fraction of the power that it had started with, it could still carry out its revenge. Nine of the signatories to Charles I's death warrant were tried and executed. Cromwell, of course, was already dead, so the Royal Court got round this little technicality by digging up his corpse, <laughs> hanging him, beheading him, and putting the head in Westminster Hall. <laughs> and now, of course, there's thousands of accounts, apparently, of people that hear Cromwell's ghosts, but I reckon if anyone was to genuinely hear Cromwell's ghost, what it would probably be saying is, all that ass ought to get us over to Parliament. <laughs> and then we end up with this pillock. <laughs> Rum old doing it. <laughs>